to go and um, do surveys, probably 50, 60, 70 percent of, of the birds you identify will be by call. You won't be identifying them by actually seeing them because they'll be stuck in thick bush or they'll be around the back of something that you walk around the back of and they disappear again. So you just really can't get close to them. All good? Um, so getting to know the calls is pretty critical. And then because the birds use the calls in all sorts of ways, understanding what they're doing with the call is important as well. So we know that they use it to advertise territories and for, for a lot of birds there's a whole lot of information packed into a call. If, if you're trying, if you're another male bird and you're hearing a call, birds can actually assess the quality of the male that's making the call. So the, the ability to produce particular frequencies a lot can tell you about the male's health and condition. And if you're thinking about going in there and taking over that territory or taking over the female and you're realising that that's a big bird in there or a healthy bird, you might back off. Whereas down the road you're hearing a call that's not as strong, that doesn't go on for as long and has components lacking that only the best can do, then you might decide to go in and, and have a go at that territory. So there are things going on there all the time. And the females attracting a mate, the females again are assessing calls and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about them later but um, there's some sonograms here of particular calls and I'll talk about what sonograms are. And if a male can produce 16 of those beeps in every second, he's a really fit male and you can actually go out and play it and the females will come up and start their mating um, postures with the calls that are over 16 per second, whereas the ones that are under 16 per second are not as fit and you get lower rates of female attraction to the call. But there's some neat stuff that you can do with a whole suite of things where fitness and honest indicators like we had with the colour are apparent with the sound that a bird can make. The other thing is birds, they hear differently from us. They hear much more effectively. So the time frame over which we hear one call, which may have many components to it, they actually are hearing three or four calls three or four components within that one call that we're hearing. So they can split the sound down into much smaller time fragments. So their hearing is a lot more effective in that sense. They're hearing things... Yeah, the whisper. They're hearing things, but we, we can manipulate those calls and so look at how they respond to them. And, and they're hearing things that we're not. Uh, again, like the colour. You know, we have our perception of the world. Most of the world, most of the animals in the world don't see the world in the way we see it. And so it is with hearing. They're not hearing what we're hearing. Uh, deterring predators, that ability to hear an alarm call and respond to it is pretty important. And there's some neat experiments being done where you can take a bird from the wild and put it in a cage and show it a predator on a rotating structure so that if you look at the structure from above you might have an owl over here but here you have a teddy bear and here's your wild bird and here's one that's naive it's been brought up inside um, from a never seen an, an adult bird from the wild never heard one so you've kept it separate. And you can show the owl to the wild bird and it gives its alarm call. But at the same time, the naive bird is seeing the teddy. So it's learning to associate the alarm call with the teddy bear. You flip it around the other way, so the teddy's on this side and the owl's on that side, and the wild bird does nothing. 
So at the time, the naive bird is seeing the owl, it's not associating it with an alarm call. And then you can take the wild bird away and the next generation, you can stick a naive bird over here and you can put your now not naive to a teddy bear bird. So you've trained it to a teddy bear and you can show it the teddy bear and it'll give the alarm call. At the same time, the naive bird over here is seeing the owl and it can learn to associate the alarm call with the owl. You swoop it around the other way, naive bird sees the owl, not harmful, it doesn't give the call and the naive bird sees the teddy, doesn't worry about it. So you can actually skip generations by training different birds in what's alarm and what's not. And teaching birds about all those different types of predators is really important. So we've got a population of yellowtail black cockatoos in Adelaide and if we really want to release them over here to replace the very much dwindling population here, we'd have to train them up to respond to predators. So the ones that they released about 10 years ago when they released them, they all disappeared within a few months because the predators took them out and they hadn't developed the, the ability to respond to predators in the right way. So they're naive to those predators and usually by the time they've learnt enough out here in the wild, it's too late, they're gone. So when we release things like Carnaby's cockatoos in WA, they now, prior to releasing them, they put them in with a wild bird and then they bring different predators along, trained predators, they set them up in the air, they have a big long flyaway, the wild bird gives its alarm call and flies off. All the naive birds that have been brought up in that cage learn to associate the alarm with the presence of the predator. And so you build them up over time to all the predators they need to be aware of and then you take them out and release them and hopefully they, they learn that. But those calls are critical. And, and the, what a bird learns is limited by the, the capacity that they have in their brain to record particular sounds and to emulate those sounds. And they talk about birds having a plastic phase of learning calls and then later on they, they have locked in the calls that they've learned and that's what they'll do for the rest of their life. And then there are other birds where they, they have particular frequencies that they can hear and respond to and you can play a, a different species all together, the calls of that, and they'll pick up on the bits that correspond to the bits they have in their brain that they can learn. But they won't pick up on the bits that don't fit into the, the type of call they would normally do. So there's a lot of things going on with, with all of these. And then, you know, there's calls for all sorts of other reasons. Um, and we, we'll talk about some of those. So, how do they do it? Well, the first thing is they have lungs that are a little bit different to ours. They have the two lungs like we do, but they have a whole lot of other stuff that's coming off and hollow bones and a whole lot of tubes through the bones so that air can move through. So there's a whole complexity of breathing structures in addition to the two main lungs. And that means that they can breathe in a very different way from what we breathe. So when we breathe, we breathe in the air through a whole bunch of tubes. So the trachea, bronchioles, um, and down, bronchi, sorry, and down into the bronchioles, and then there's little sacs at the end, alveoli. But to get the air into those sacs, we have to actually move it through a whole bunch of tubes. And that's dead space. And if you are diving and you put a snorkel on, you add another layer of dead space. So to actually get new air in through my snorkel down into my alveola, I have to take up all the air out of the snorkel, all the air out of my mouth, trachea, bronchi and bronchioles, and that has to fill the alveoli before I start getting new air in. And on the way back out, the same. So... We have a lot of dead space and, and that adds a little bit of a complexity. Now, 
Typically, the air we breathe is 21% oxygen. So one-fifth of the air we're breathing is oxygen. And that doesn't matter if you're at sea level or right up on top of Mount Everest. The difference up on top of Mount Everest is the space between the particles is lot lower, a lot greater. So as we go higher, the pressure drops. So if we halve the pressure, we're doubling the distance between the particles. One-fifth oxygen. About four-fifths of it is nitrogen. Forgive my writing. Um, about four-fifths is nitrogen. There's 1% left that all the other gases um, fit into. They're not very common. The one that we know a little bit about, carbon dioxide, it's about percent. Okay? It's on the increase. If I was teaching this 20 years ago, I'd be saying 0.036 or something like that. So it's slowly and steadily changing. Um, I think I've got the decimal point right there. And when we breathe in, there's virtually no carbon dioxide there and lots of oxygen. When we breathe out, we use up about 5% of the oxygen. So that's why we can do mouth to mouth. We, we're not breathing out no oxygen. But there's some left over, 16% left over. And the nitrogen, nothing much has happened to it. It stayed there. The carbon dioxide, about 5% of the air we breathe out is CO2. So we've taken in the oxygen. It's gone through to our cells, process of respiration. It's reacted with the carbohydrates or whatever and we've produced water and carbon dioxide and we breathe out the carbon dioxide. So when we're breathing out, the air has lots of carbon dioxide in it and not as much oxygen. So that dead space is full of air that's not carrying as much oxygen. So when we breathe back in, we're diluting the carbon dioxide and we're adding in some more oxygen to it. But still, it's not a very efficient system. Birds don't have that. The only dead space a bird has is from its mouth through... After that, when the air's coming in, it's actually coming in to the bottom half of the lung first. And the air that was in the bottom half of the lung, it's chuffing up into the front half of the lung. So it's actually going from being down here up into these bits of the lung up here, all the extra bits. And when they breathe out, the air from the top half of the lung goes out and the air that was in the bottom half of the lung, the new stuff, it comes up into the top half of the lung. So it's actually a circuit. Yeah, and it's much more efficient. So a bird can be flying at 5,000 metres or 6,000 metres. At 3,000 metres, the amount of oxygen in the air is halved. It's still 21%, but there's half as much there. So at 3,000 metres, we start to feel the effects of lower oxygen. 6,000, 9,000 metres, by the time you're top of Mount Everest, you're actually dealing with very low oxygen levels. A bird can be flying at five or 6,000 metres, and because of this system of breathing, it's getting much we would be getting at the same height. So the lungs are, are a lot more effective. That's a real advantage. The other part is that just where the two main bronchi meet at the point of that trachea, they have what we might call the voice box, crudely. In the same way that we have our voice box, our, our larynx here, they have what we would call a syrinx. It, it's a bit different from ours. It's structured in a different way. And I'd like to just quickly talk about that because it, it's that structure that is pretty key to the songbirds and the complexity of calls that they can make. So we had the two bronchi coming from both lungs up and then the trachea going out to the bird's mouth. So in the, in the chest, at about the same height where we would have 
our voice box, our larynx. Theirs is a bit lower down because theirs is actually where the two bronchi meet. And then within that there's a, a few complexities. But they're <coughs> not as complex as what they would... Um, well, the, 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 the 22 orders of birds that are non passerines they have very simple syrinxes. And they're, they're simple in a number of ways. They're simple in how many muscle rings there are around the, each of the bronchi. So if you can imagine a tire tube around the outside of each of the bronchi, that's a ring of muscle, and we're just cut straight through. That's why we're seeing it as, as two spots. That tire tube can constrict and relax. When it constricts, it's just changing the diameter of the bronchi. So you can change the noise that comes out when air moves through it, the vibration, by making it smaller or larger. In passerines, you get up to nine rings of muscle around the bronchi coming out of the lungs. And up here. And in that way, a passerine is able to manipulate the whole structure of each of the bronchi, make it narrower and wider at different points as the air comes in. And they can force air out under pressure from the, the, the lungs and set this up so that it plays a tune, like a flute, makes a vibration. They can also change this little tympanic membrane, tighten it or loosen it. They can make this whole syrinx bigger or smaller and they can change the pressure of the air going out by using those muscles. But the part that's really neat is they can be playing a low frequency here on this side and they can be playing a high frequency there on that side. So they can be huffing and puffing with both sides producing different frequencies, which means that they might play a rising note using the air from this side and then very quickly just switch over and play a descending note with the air coming through from that side. And that means that they can very quickly change the, the type of frequency that you're hearing the, just by switching from one lung to the other. And you'll see birds when they're calling, this whole throat will pop out and that's the syrinx getting bigger and smaller. And, and again, it's not just about the vibrations coming in, it's about the vibrations going out as well. Okay, so it's located where the two bronchi meet. It's controlled by those pairs of muscles and the difference between the 22 orders that the non passerines that have the simple honking or um, very simple dove like calls or whatever, the parrot like calls, they're playing with simple instruments. They don't have the complexity that the passerines do. So, with, with the passerines, you might have um, a, a bird like the, oh, fallen out of my head lyrebird, which can pretty much make any noise it hears. And it, it's got a whole set of muscles and a very uh, detailed neural input um, that allows it to manipulate the calls with great complexity. And so the pattern birds, the songbirds, are able to make much more complex calls than you get in, in most of those other orders. Um, okay. So what would be a, ma a magpie then? It's a passerine yeah. and that beautiful complexity of calls that you hear them make those warbles and all that, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're playing, they're really playing the bagpipes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. The other thing is that birds, the way they 
they call, can be split into two general groups, and that's songs and calls. And the songs, they're generally used for territorial situations or to attract a mate, so defending against other males or trying to um, get a female to come in. There can be a variety of songs within one species, and the thing about songs is we might be hearing them as just a simple noise, but the complexity within them might be much more important for the bird than what we're hearing. So songs can be those beautiful things that you hear from um, golden whistlers and that sort of thing through to very simple calls as far as we're concerned. Uh, um, some of the, the, I don't know, some of the larks and things like that can have quite simple calls. Um, so they don't always have to be melodious to be a song, but it's the, what, it's the role they play that makes them a song. They vary across regions in the same way as we go across Australia and hear all different dialects. If you speak to a North Queenslander, it's a bit different from speaking to a, a South Australian. Uh, even just crossing the border into Victoria, it makes a big difference. So those dialects are seen in birds as well, particularly where the subspecies associated. They've been separated at some time in the past. Songs often get switched off at certain times of the year, so they're seasonal. And the part that's quite neat is we're looking for similarities in the songs, but the reality is that in the same way our voices all differ from each other, bird calls within the one species differ from each other as well. So you, you actually can study them and um, analyse them scientifically and detect the differences between individuals. And then you can play with those calls and look at what it is that, uh, for example, a mate might be choosing that makes the call more attractive to them. And then you can start to look at what that means about the bird and whether it's an honest indicator of health or condition. So in the same way as we looked at the other day with the carotenoids. So may vary between individuals of the same species. Okay. And the calls, they're generally shorter than the songs and they're used to maintain contact often between individuals or they're used for alarm. Um, and they can change them depending on the habitat. And there's a lot of interesting things with calls, high frequency versus low frequency. The same with the songs, high frequency versus low frequency. If I'm giving a very low humming sort of call, <coughs> it's really difficult to work out where I am. Whereas if I'm giving a high pitch call, you will know where I am. It's easier to detect direction with the high pitch call. If you look at some birds, um, some of the parrots in New Zealand, for example, their mating calls, very low pitched ooms that you hear for miles, but low pitched and really hard to find. And one of the ideas with them is that as their numbers have got really low, it's been harder and harder for the females to find the males because they are such a low pitched call. If you're giving a high pitched call though, that alarm that you're giving may open you to a bit of threat from detection, from, from predators and things like that. So there's, there's payoffs depending on what you're doing with your call. Now, to help you start to learn the calls, it's important to give you some memory aids. And, and you know, we talk about where transliteration, where you're actually learning to write something down that reflects what you're hearing. Uh, mnemonics, which are actually some word or something to help you as a memory aid. Um, you know, classic mnemonic would be for the colours of the rainbow, Roy G. Biv. So there's a simple mnemonic that you can remember. And phonetics. Now, I'm going to play some different calls for you. And we'll go through. With any luck, I won't run out of battery. And 
starting with the scarlet robin. And this is the description that you get of that call in the book. It's a pretty, lilting, wee, cheetalee, cheetalee. Now, the cheetalee, you can particularly hear as, as the call plays. So here we go again. Can you hear the cheetalee at the end? And you can hear the little wee in there as well. Get the wee chiddly at the end. Chiddly. This is a different subspecies. So to actually look at that in the book is meaningless. You, you're never going to picture this call from that. But if you're actually listening to the call and seeing the bird and you look in the book and it talks about wee cheetalee, I can hear that wee cheetalee in there and that might be a little memory aid that I can use next time I'm out there and I hear this call. I can hear wee cheetalee at the end of that call. So keeping that in mind might be the little thing that just gets me through that learning phase to the point where I hear this call regularly and know what it is. Okay. Now we'll go to one that does present people with a little bit of a challenge. There's various whistlers that we have over here in EP, at least three. Oh, before I start, they talk about three main calls. So you've got sweet-a-wit, sweet-a-wit, a rising wit, 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 whittle, a brisk d d d a wit, and there's a contact call, a seep call. Now, again, you're not going to be able to picture that call from those descriptions. But listen to this and see which one you reckon it is. Yeah. yeah, it's brisk. And it is, you can see the DDDD uh, width. And it's just a simple little word, set of words, that are trying to get a picture into your head of the sound. And that's where guys like Graham Fizzy were really good. They could come up with a little set of words that would help you to learn it. So that's the first one. Let's try this one. Not quite any of those, but it's close. It's rising. You can hear that, and you can certainly hear the, the whittle at the end. How about this one? Sweet of it, and it's quite brisk. And this is two birds having a territorial dispute, so they're pretty close to each other, two males competing with each other. So you can definitely picture the sweeter wit there. So there's three calls and 
now that you've heard them, that actually makes a little bit of sense. And you could come back to that book and try and remember the call. And just to... This is a contact call between two people. And it is quite a... Okay, so there's four calls that are part of the Golden Whistler repertoire. And as you go across Australia, that changes. So the different subspecies vary it a little bit. Be aware of that. So what is that? What is the like, golden whistles that we had? They would talk to you if you walked through the, you don't know, I forget your Hebrew, the usual, and they would answer, they'd follow you. Yeah. What are they doing? Why, is it, why are they doing uh, Well, I, I don't know exactly why. I do know that when you give their call, they will come over and check you out. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, I really don't know why. No, so Yep. To that. Yeah, yeah, they're responding, but what it is, I don't know. Um, whether it's just inquisitive, whether they are checking you out because you're making it. Um, tonight I did that that um, sort of general just ch -ch 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 sort of call. If you're in a, a thick bit of bush and you can hear birds all around but none are coming out, often if you do that they'll come over and look at you they're interested, it's sort of like an alarm call, it's just a general alarm call and they'll just come over and have a look. Mm. And I've had times where I've had 10 species all around me, all just looking at me. It's great, it's great for a picture or two. Mm. But you're just using that little alarm call type noise to, to bring them over to you. Um, one that we get around that people use with the golden whistler is the rufus whistler. which is sort of tonally quite similar to the Golden Whistler. But when you... When you the, the descriptions in the book, this will help you tease them apart from the Golden Whistler. So I'm going to... Later tonight I'll write the names of these apps up and it, it, it's just made the world a whole lot easier because of the, the um, ability to hear the calls repeatedly and learn them. But you can sit down with the call and your bird book and actually start to help yourself remember them. And that can be really useful. You know, it took me 20 or more years to learn a whole bunch of birds and I'd forgotten a whole lot of them. And particularly when you start travelling around Australia as I've done, you forget the ones that you learnt 15 years ago because they're different wherever you are and, and that can be quite a challenge. But having the apps now will, will help you. And something I used to do a lot was before I started surveys, I'd spend a couple of hours just walking around familiarising myself with the calls again, getting them into my head um, just to make sure I, I was on top of it before I then went and did the surveys. And over the next week or so, it was all good because I'd have refresh the memory with the different calls. Um, one that we get from here north and, and is a particularly lovely bird is Gilbert's Whistler. Um, and it has some quite distinctive songs. And you can see that swelling in sequence 11 to 18 times, so they vary the amount of... There you go. So that's one of them. Here's one of them. That's actually not the width rather than E. Here's another one. So 
it's a bit more like you're getting the E and the Cha. So there's the two elements to it. It's still not exactly what's written there. And that's where you can come along and in your own notes just add in a few other calls that you're hearing and you're dealing with local variations. It's not possible for these authors to go to every part of Australia and hear every bird call and record it. But they will often have the variations. So there, there's a beginning on a few memory aids and how to use the book but, but doing it differently from what most people start out trying to do and that's to hear the call and then go to the book and try and use the, what's written to identify the bird. That, that's not going to help you. That's, that, that's going to confuse you more than anything. Okay. Then there's a system that's being used in... It's not used in, in, in Pithy, but it's being used in a lot of bird books all over the world now. And, and that's a, a way of actually hearing the call and, and um, using transliteration, a, 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 a means of helping you to picture what it would sound like. So it, it's using the spacing that's written in the book to help you to understand what the call's doing. So in a case where there's no pause between the sounds, so you're just getting a <whistles> and they're just one feeding directly into the next one, they would just write it as something that's continuous. Then where, where there's a slight discernible pause, something that might be, I don't know, <whistles> just a little break between them, through to dashes for a short pause, and then heading up into more of a normal pause and then a, like a second long pause where commas start to come into play and then you can have longer ones again. And so on. And, and just learning to write like that when you're hearing the call can give you an immediate way of, of transliterating, of just writing down what you're hearing. So that can be quite useful. Combined with the next element, it can be very useful. Um, and it, it's useful for a number of reasons. And I'll, I'll just give some examples first, and then we'll go two birds, Quite similar. We looked at them a few weeks ago. Do you remember? They occupy habitat that overlaps and they're really annoying because they flit behind a bush and then you walk around to see them and they flit behind the next bush. And all you ever get is little glimpses here and there. So to try and tell them apart is tricky. But if you're hearing calls, you can um, be a lot more successful. So the first one, that's the Rufus Field Wren. I'm sure you all recognised it. Let me, here we go. Okay. Yeah. That was the crunching noise you heard straight after it. So Shy Heath Wren is the second one. And that calls that you can pick apart. And you don't really have to see the bird to be quite comfortable about which one it is. So that's the first one. Next one are birds that even when you do see them 
look very, very similar. And trying to actually pick them apart in the area that they nearly overlap in is tricky. They're geographically separate. So one's up through uh, sort of from, um, what's the best? Uh, sort of midway up South Australia and across to the west and the other one is sort of midway up South Australia and across to the east. And they're, they're two quite similar birds in the field and until you hear them call. And then when you hear them call, this is the chirping wedge bill. Quite distinctive and goes on and on and on. Can yep, squeaky wheel. And then there's a chiming wedge bill. So again, they're both annoying. <laughs> And if you do, if you do use the, but did you get drunk? They can drive you batty after a while. <laughs> yep. So this is the one that's found across towards on the western side, from central South Australia and Northern Territory across to the west. And then the other one, which is the Chirruping, is from the central across to the east, through the desert country. So there you, the call is the definitive answer. If you're looking and thinking, what on earth is it? You know, am I sure it's a chirruping? Well, I'm, I'm sort of in the middle part of where the distributions might overlap and um, you're not really able to make a call on, on subtleties with crests and things like that. Then the call, and instantly you know which one you've got. So what... Um what was the purpose of their monotonous calls? Is that a, a mate attracting thing or a mate driving? I presume it's a territorial thing, but I'm not exactly certain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and what what it is that it's achieving, I don't know. Um, the, the, a lot of this stuff, people have asked questions and gone and done some work on it, but a whole bunch of other species, no one's looked at it. Yeah. One of the things that really changed the way you could um, picture what the call was like was the use of sonograms. And um, when I was in Zimbabwe, the, the book over there, they called it a field guide, but you actually needed a couple of hands to carry it. It used sonograms with the calls and I found that was quite a, a revelation. I could actually begin to picture the call. And um, this is frequency on the y-axis versus time. And frequency is going from zero hertz, remember hertz is one cycle per second, up to 12,000 hertz. And here you've got an increasing frequency and then a drop, increase and then a drop. And the time here uh, is 0.2 of a second. So these are coming quite quickly. So that's one second there, 1.08, 1.09. And to give you some of the, uh, an example of them, the Rufus scrub, scrub bird is a, an east coast species. Um, where has he gone? There we go. That's actually a bit slower than yeah, what this recording slow, yeah. shows. Yeah.
That, that's the sort of range of calls that you get for them. But you can begin to picture that, that sort of frequency. And then you've got something like the forest raven. The thing about the forest raven is the calls, they're low frequency and there's calls right across, there's elements right across all of those frequencies up to about 6,000 hertz. So it's a quite a, a broad, deep call. And to give you... Um, That's not what you're hearing here, but you can begin to understand what they're recording here. Each one of these bars on this one is one second. Here's one. But you can see that complex sort of call. There's all sorts of frequencies thrown in there and it's quite deep. So sonograms do provide some useful ways of, of picturing things and interpreting them becomes quite easy. So with this call, one frequency all the way across. you can almost begin to play that and, and listen to what's coming back at you. It, 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 it's quite easy to, to picture. This one, again, where you've got lots of frequencies, these are thousands of hertz, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, where you've got lots of frequencies all together, you get that nasally sort of sound coming through. So, you, you, you've got a mixture of frequencies there. And, and so over one second you can begin to pick it. And where we hear that sort of the birds may be hearing the individual elements of all that. And learning to, to be able to draw that can be handy, it can help you. Um, so if, if you're thinking of, of something on a sonogram that's going down, you, you can start to picture that. Whereas if it's going up, you can see the difference. So you can actually draw that and help yourself to remember it. You can even draw a little graph and just draw what you're hearing. And I'll, I'll play one for you one that when I was in Ethiopia um, I heard a bit and, and it was in forest and I wasn't seeing the bird. I could actually hear the call. It's a beautiful call. And let me just play it for you. Um, Ground throated wattle eye. So I could actually, took me a while to work it out. So again. I could actually start to picture that after a while and then I could draw it and then you can come back and work out what on earth it is. So and that that's a, a nice one because it oops, sorry. 
that's a nice one because it's it's one where you can picture it quite neatly. And the the thing about this was when I went to Ethiopia, my job there was to teach two large groups of tribes about the birds that that were in the bush around them, so that they could do surveys. And I didn't know the birds. I could learn the birds from the books, and I could produce training programs like this to teach them about the birds. And I could go on the internet and just look up each of the birds and there's repositories for that that's here. And I could go over there and, and play the calls. They they knew most of the birds. They knew that call. You know, if you're out in the in an area where they're found, you just hear it all the time. You know that call. And then I could quickly link it to what bird it was and away they go. So that's what you've got to do for yourself. You've got to be able to take what you're hearing, be use whatever's available and the books and teach yourself and then you're away. How long does it take? <laughs> 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 Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things I gave them when we were starting was sheets like this so that they could look at colours for the birds. You know, they could, they could colour all that in and say that's all grey or, or whatever. But it, it started to get them to think about the regions of the bird. And the other one was I, I put just a little axis there so you can actually do the call as we did with the um, cuckoos in that last week, you can start to draw that cuckoo call and think about what you're actually seeing and, and relate it to what you're hearing. So the, it, it, it can be done and, and hopefully I've given you a few different tools now that will help you to start to, to do the calls. It, it's about you listening and, and in your notebooks, and we'll talk about notebooks next week, starting to think, how can I picture this call? How can I remember it? Because it's all very well that I come along and say, we build whatever, but you know that, that's 40 odd years down the track. And, and so you, you get to know them after a while, but you've got to get over that hump and, and, and this, the, the, the three different systems I've, I've told you about tonight are, are really neat ways to do that. Um, something that some people have got into recording the calls. Um, and, and the re recording of the calls are, are what fill our apps and make it possible. Um, and they're, they're recordings that people don't do much of. And so on Air Peninsula you'll hear a lot of birds where the call is different from what you're actually hearing out here. Because there's not many people who have actually been over here long enough and recorded all the different species and all the different calls they have. Um, and we've got a few people from previous courses who have got interested in this. These are recorders that you can get now. They're about six, seven hundred dollars. And they're recorders that are quite, um, well, the quality of, of sound that they record is, is perfect. You, 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 we're not going to have any sort of hassle with what's produced, nor are the birds. And they're, they're ones that um, a lot of the, the bands use nowadays, just quick and easy. Um, normally, just like that, they have two microphones on it which are directionally sensitive and so you can point it at the birds and it'll cut out most of the sound outside of a certain arc. And you can actually change the angle of that arc if you want. But uh, it, it, it's a simple system. You just press record and it just picks up the sound. If you want to get a bit more technical, um, then you can get a directional microphone. And the directional microphones are guys like this. Um, the thing about these is if a sound comes in from the side there's a delay between the sound hitting this side and the sound hitting that side of the microphone 
and the microphone can detect that and cut that sound out. So what it means is I can point it directly at the bird call and it just picks up on those sounds. And if there's all sorts of other things going on around here, it cuts them out or deadens them at least. The other direction the sound can be picked up from is behind as well. So I can't discern between behind and in front. But something like that, again, it's about six, eight hundred dollars, depending on how much you want to spend. They, I can go out into the bush with, with just this and get high quality calls that um, I can then come back and there's free software on the internet that you can cut and, and play the, the call in any way that you want and store it away, save it. You can save it as different file types and in the end you... Um, can then put it up onto the internet, onto those sites like the one I sought the calls from for Ethiopia. Or alternatively, you can contact these guys who are making these bird apps and say, do you want some calls from um, Air Peninsula or whatever species? So those, those are all possibilities. Be, be aware if, if, if sound is something that you're interested in, and, you know, if you happen to play a guitar and record music anyway, you probably have one of these. But that, that it by itself will give you a good quality recording of calls. And you, you, you don't need anything else, really. Um, how you save it's important. Um, ben, what's the file type for sound that, that they use to simplify the calls? Mostly they want MP3 or a Yeah, so... So the MP3 calls, the, the reason they use that is it limits what's recorded to just the human hearing range. Uh, so you need to be careful of that. It'll give you a much smaller file, but if you're actually wanting to play it back at the bird, the bird's not going to be hearing what you're hearing. So um, the way you save it's important. Um, so the WAV files, WV, AV and there's another one again I can never remember. Anyway, the, those possibilities are quite fun if, if that's what you like. Be aware of that. Um, and hopefully in a few years' time we'll get a few more calls from Air Peninsula onto the apps. Um, any questions? Yeah. No, it's only certain birds, and it, it's about the the what they can produce, the complexity of sounds they can produce. So, it, your your parrots and that can do a lot of that sort of stuff. Um, but if you really want those complex range of calls, you know your lyrebirds and that are unparalleled. Yeah, so they, they, they can hear whatever it is, whether it's a chainsaw through to someone hammering and, and repeat the call. Um, well, for some it's innate. So things like a cuckoo, they don't see their parents again, so mm -hmm. it must be innate. But for others, it, it's very much learned. And, and there's... Um, look... I, I've given you a very quick summary of something that is really huge um, and, and complex. There's all sorts of things going on. The way in which they learn has been researched really quite neatly. Um, and they talk about phases where the bird is practicing the call and just learning it. And then there's a, a, a plastic phase where they start to perfect it and, and they get better at it from listening to all the parents. And then there's a, a, a final phase where it's sort of locked in concrete and, and so it, it goes on. And that might be over the first year typically. Um, for other birds it might take two, three, four, five to pull down well enough to actually start attracting a mate. Um, and there's different species where that can take yeah, quite a while to 
to really fine tune exactly what they need to do. And, and when you look at uh, some of the birds in the The, the ones that do the beautiful dances, the apple birds and um, things like that, they, those, those calls and the dances and the building of the displays, they take years to perfect before they finally do them well enough that a female coming past will even stop and have a look. Um, and we, we have um, various birds that, that use that same display system set out across Australia. So it's interesting to, to think about what they're doing with their call and everything else. Um, look, that, that's just a, a beginning. Uh, and I hope that the main thing I've given you is that there are ways of helping yourself to learn the calls. And you don't need to be following around behind someone just listening and having them repeat every day what it is that the call is. You can actually start to teach yourself and record it and, and add in your books the little differences that you hear and you will hear birds do different things. So partaloads don't always just, straight up partaloads around here just, don't just do that double call, the wit wit sort of call. They, they do other things as well and if you hear that write it down just, and even better record it. All good? Yep, yep grab yourself a cuppa and um, we'll get on to...